Kathy Kane, welcome to Shrink Wrap Radio. Happy to be here. Well, I'm so happy to have you here. And we're going to be discussing your new book, Nurturing Resilience, Helping Clients Move Forward from Developmental Trauma. And so, of course, that raises the question. We, we hear about trauma all the time, uh, the trauma of war, automobile accidents, etc. What do you mean by developmental trauma? Developmental trauma is generally considered to be trauma that happens very early in childhood. So um, through pregnancy to about three years of age, some experts like Bruce Perry cut it off more at five years of age. But there's also a functional definition, we might call it, is pretty much anything that disturbs the normal development through childhood could be considered developmental trauma. So the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, which I know we'll talk about a little later, actually measured um, to the age of 18. And really what we're looking at is something that interrupts the development of the physical systems and the personality through the course of childhood. Okay. And how important then is the family environment in determining whether things go right or go wrong? It's extremely important in both sides of the proposition. So it's important in terms of developing resilience so that then challenges through childhood don't have the same impact. So a healthy family environment can nurture, literally nurture resilience, but also the family environment can contribute to whether or not there is trauma. So active neglect or abuse, but also absentee parents, parents that are incarcerated, parents that are drug addicted or alcohol mm -hmm. addicted, who are themselves um, suffering from their own trauma or mental health issues so that they're not available to the child can have a tremendous impact on whether or not stressing experiences become traumatic experiences. Yeah, and you mentioned resilience, and of course that's in the title, and I think we all have at least a vague idea of what's meant by resilience, but in your work, how do you define it or think about it? Well, the kind of foundational piece of it is that you've had a sense of safety and belonging. And those are probably the two main things that contribute to the development of resilience. And then there's the factors that we use to measure it. And there are things like, do we recover from challenges? Do we experience ourselves as being capable and able to meet challenges? I'm also looking at physiological resilience. So does the person have the capacity to physiologically respond to challenges. So they have a stress response, but they come back to a resting state in their physiology afterwards. All of us would have something like constriction in our muscle systems, tight neck, the usual things we think of as normal stress. But do we recover from that stress and come back into a resting state? Those are some of the factors that I would be looking at somatically that would indicate resilience. But there's also the sort of behavioral and psychological factors of do we recover from challenges? That's kind of yeah. the essential of, of how we determine resilience. Yeah, I just realized I relate to that idea of coming back after, uh, you know, having your heart rate come back or down or something. I used to be uh, a big bicyclist, mountain biking, mm -hmm. later road biking, and now I go to the gym. And uh, that's the kind of thing that they monitor. You know, I've got a heart monitor on my watch. Okay. <laughs> and so, you know, how long does it take to come from that high heartbeat down to uh, arresting heartbeat. So yeah, that's exactly right. That's a sort of simple version of a normal stress because exercise is stress in, in a positive way. Not all stress mm -hmm. is negative stress, but do we recover from it? That's really the, the key. Do we recover or does it become something chronic um, that we are subject to on an ongoing basis? Yeah, yeah, good point. Now you mentioned that when you're talking about uh, about childhood uh, and, and developmental trauma, that it could go by some measures go all the way up to age 18. But I'm wondering if there is, if you will, some kind of a, a critical age range in which uh, developmental trauma tends to develop or show itself. Yeah, and that's that young age, that zero to five. And part of the reason for that is that we're dependent on our caregivers during that time. The more independence we have, so the more maturity we have in, in our physical systems and our psychological and emotional systems, the less we're dependent on other people to take care of us. So that young age childhood, we're almost completely dependent on our caregivers. We don't have the capacity to create our own safety, so to speak. 
the safety has to be mm -hmm. either environmental or, or be um, created within the family environment because we don't have the, the capability to do that ourselves. So we're particularly vulnerable in that kind of age frame. Right, right. And of course, that puts me in mind of Freud and the whole psychoanalytic school that emphasize the, the importance of those early years. And then more recently, attachment theory has really focused in uh, in a much more nuanced way uh, That's right. about, that, about that whole area. That's so, right. Uh, yeah. And, and so you were talking about uh, safety. Uh, talk a little bit about the role of feeling safe or not. Well, we've got the different uh, possible layers of that. So the first thing is physical safety. Do we have access to food? So you look at a child, for example, in an orphanage, and um, maybe they are physically safe in the sense that they're in a contained environment, but they may be, depending on where that could be, if it's in a war-torn country where there's not a lot of resources, they could be on the edge of starvation, they might have chronic infections, so their physical sense of safety is compromised, even though at a kind of an objective level, they're otherwise relatively safe. So we have physical safety, and that could include living um, in a place where there's pollutants and, and toxic substances around us, so it's compromising our physical ability to develop. It could be we're living in a crime-ridden area where we're subject to fear all the time. And then there is what you might call social safety. So do we feel safe in our family environment? We're not being abused, we're not being threatened, we're not observing abuse happening in the household. And we have caregivers that are stable enough to respond to our needs. They are present enough. And that is where there's this big overlap with attachment theory. In attachment theory, we have the concept of the good enough parent. You don't yeah. have to be a perfect parent. You just have to get it right a certain and actually relatively small percentage of the time. So, you know, the safety is partly do we have caregivers that are responding to us in ways that help us feel safe? We cry, they respond to our cries and they determine what the issue is. Have we been hurt? Are we hungry? And they respond to the distress that we're exhibiting. And then there's the perception of safety within our own systems. So one of the um, errors that can uh, happen in, mis in a misunderstanding in terms of developmental trauma is it only comes from bad parenting. But if you take the example of a child that's had um, a severe medical issue early in their life and they've been hospitalized and perhaps separated from their caregivers just due to the fact that there's risk of infection or something like that, and that's gone on long enough to compromise the child's development of their own self-perception so then if someone comes to touch them, for example, that's affiliated with um, distressing or painful medical interventions now, perhaps. Mm -hmm. So then a caregiver comes to try to soothe them, and the child can't take up that offer of nurturing and relationship. So not through any fault of the, the parents or through the attachment system, so to speak. We now have a child that is unable to perceive the safety when it's on offer because their, their physiological systems have been disrupted enough that their perception of safety is no longer accurate, so to speak. So, so that's another subtle version of perception. Uh -huh. So the, the threat can uh, become internalized. That's right. That's right. So, so I go inside not, to see if I'm uh -huh. okay, and the information I get is that there's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I can't help but think how unsafe so much of the world is right now. And at this very moment, we have uh, some thousands of, of people trying to escape crime and gangs in Honduras that are headed toward the U.S. border. And the chil children are sleeping on the streets and, uh, and the adults have to be terribly anxious. So that's right. Uh, th th this must just be creating so much trauma in these people's lives that it's That's uh, true. and we're uh, as children we're looking to the adults around us to help us mm -hmm. recognize safety and in that situation the adults can't give us that information because they're accurately perceiving that they aren't safe and yeah. so for the child they're getting these repeated information of disruption and dislocation and then distress in the adults around them and then that's going to be if that goes on long enough Fortunately, many children are, in fact, quite resilient and short term bursts of stress. And especially if you then can be settled and you have access to good 
settled caregiving, we can recover from a lot of early stress. It doesn't equal trauma because there's been disruption, but if it goes on long enough, that's the recipe that you're going to end up with. Yeah. If any of us can sustain that kind of stress for extended periods without some kind of impact. Huh. It's such a good reminder, though, to know that trauma does not necessarily lead to lasting, uh, for example, PTSD. Right. And, you know, that there's research that fascinatingly shows that some people maybe innately, genetically, uh, have a lot of resilience. That's right. That's right. bounce back. Bounce and, back. you know, it doesn't take, sometimes it's only access to a single person who helps us build resilience. So it might be a grandmother in the family, could be a sibling, could be a teacher. It could be the parents of our friend that we play with. So we're in their household regularly enough that we have access to a more settled adult presence that helps us build those capacities. So the challenging beginning doesn't always equal trauma. Yeah. Um, it's actually the minority of people end up with trauma from those challenging beginnings. The trouble is it can end up being a pretty big number when you're talking about big numbers of people that are being exposed to it. So mm -hmm. the total, it still might be only 30% of people exposed to those factors are developing long lasting effects. But yeah. if you're talking about tens of thousands of people, it starts to be a big number of people that are suffering from the side effects of developmental trauma. Yeah, this, what are you getting at there with the side effects? Well, I mean, now we have so much research. The Adverse Childhood Experiences study is the biggest one, but we have more. Um, and that was a Kaiser Permanente study that was initially actually started in um, relation to weight loss. And the people running that study started noticing that some of the participants having the most success at weight loss were dropping from the study. And they got curious about what was happening. And when they went back and interviewed them, they found out that what they had in common was childhood trauma. And that's how that adverse childhood experiences study started. So then mm -hmm. Kaiser went out to members and began, um, they created this um, adverse childhood experiences questionnaire that originally only had 10 questions. Now there's lots of variations on them. And really you could distill it down that they're questions about safety and belonging. There were things mm -hmm. like, did you experience abuse? Did you witness abuse? Um, did you not have access to food? Did you go to school without having clean clothing? You know, the, the sort of measures of things like neglect. And that's really just because that was the biggest category they saw. It's not that they're saying those are the only sources of trauma. So now we have this big, long study that says we have all these side effects that go with developmental trauma. And what was most surprising to the broader population of mental health in the mental health field with the adverse childhood experiences study is a lot of the side effects are physical. And we're, the, the original questionnaire only included two questions that were about physical events like abuse. They were more things witnessing abuse and feeling unsafe, but they produce these very clear physical side effects. And one of the difficulties with childhood trauma is that it turns on genetic predispositions. So exposure to early trauma can, if you have a genetic predisposition towards heart disease or diabetes, the exposure to trauma can turn on those genetic expressions. So we have all of these physical side effects of early trauma, but there's also a growing field of research that many of the things that we think of as either personality disorders or psychological issues are really relating back to early trauma. So uh, we also have really clear data that people who've been exposed to early trauma have a higher incidence of anxiety and panic disorders. Um, there's some thinking that even the more classical personality disorders of borderline um, narcissistic may be coming from untreated early trauma. Huh. So unfortunately, the side effects of early trauma are very broad reaching um, and they, they cover the waterfront in terms of being both psychological and physical. Yeah, for so, such a long time, we had this sort of sense of separation between physical and psychological. And, um, and then there was another period where it was sort of kind of lip service to the idea of, of 
whole, being holistic and treating the whole person. That's but right. Now, the, now a lot of data has accumulated to show just how concrete and real that is. That that's right. Uh, our emotional life and our physical life are intimately tied together. And in a way, our behavioral life, because the other set of things that is affiliated with developmental trauma are increased criminality, um, which mm -hmm. is considered in part to be lack of impulse control because the development of the brain can be distorted under the influence of severe developmental trauma. Um, and we can also see the um, domestic violence can be affiliated with it and addictions. So yeah, yeah. those are all strong correlations. And again, the, the ACE study has been such an amazing source of information of how many of these things that we think of as public health issues, in effect, are coming back to um, developmental trauma. Is the ACE study the same as the Kaiser one that you were talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah. Oh, the okay. Adverse Childhood mm -hmm. Experience sure. Study. Yeah, it's, it's oh, just that's... referred to as the ACE study. And for people who want to know more about it, um, the Center for Disease Control, when they started seeing the results coming out, felt it was such a critical public health issue that they've taken on the monitoring of the um, continuing data collection. So if okay. you go to, to the Center for Disease Control website, they have a whole section on ACE, and there's all these related studies that have evolved out of it that are continuing to be done, new studies that are being done. And the CDC is monitoring the ongoing collection of data because there were, I forget what it was, 70,000 people or something. It's a huge number of people involved in the original ACE study. And they're still monitoring uh, that population and gathering data about that population. But it's no longer within Kaiser. It's the CDC now. Wow, wow. I know that your work has also been impacted by uh, the work of Stephen Porges's polyvagal theory. Uh, and uh, so how does that tie into uh, what's happening uh, at the neural know, level? I, I so wish that there would be a bigger overlap between the ACE information and Porges's information, because I feel like the polyvagal theory explains a lot of what we see in the symptoms that go with developmental trauma because his theoretical model is saying that while we are developing as a personality, as a, as a being, we're developing our physio physiology and our ability to regulate our physiological systems. Mm -hmm. And he talks about this in terms of what he calls neural platforms. So do we have the neural platform, the neurophysiological capacity in place to support different categories of behavior? So the sympathetic system in the autonomic nervous system supports activity, but it also supports threat response and stress response with getting all of the systems turning on. So we increase our heart rate and our breathing and um, our metabolizing of sugars, that kind of thing. And then on the other side, our parasympathetic system is the system that prepares us for rest and relaxation. And the main thing that Poor just brought to us is this sense that there's two subsystems in the rest side of things. And one supports social connection, what he refers to as the ventral vagus system. And it supports yeah. the neural platform that lets us connect with other people. And it regulates our ability to uh, regulates our voice, regulates our breathing. It allows us to be engaged. So we're not asleep, we're not completely at rest but we're also not in the sympathetic dominance where we're overly excited, so to speak, and overly stressed. It allows this interplay that really is very supportive of social engagement. That's the subtitle often of his theory is the, the social engagement theory. And then we have another portion of the parasympathetic system that's more about that freeze state when we're in extreme duress and we collapse, what you would see in animals in all of those nature films where you see the, the prey animal collapse. Yeah. That's mediated by a, diff a slightly different side of the parasympathetic system. And really what Porges is saying is that if we get locked into any parts of the system that are really meant for extreme survival mode, like that freeze state or the really high sympathetic arousal that we would be using when we are fleeing for our lives, then it doesn't support social connection, 
and it doesn't support the healthy physiology that we need for repair and support of the immune system, for example. So basically what we could say is that a study shows us that in a child, when they are learning to use their physiology, their nervous system in this way, if they're in survival mode during that physiological learning phase, those early years, they learn to overuse their survival physiology and they underuse the physiology that supports the immune system and digestion and supports sort of healthy uptake of nutrients. And so when we look at the symptoms that go with developmental trauma, they're often physical symptoms in these systems that mobilize when we're under threat. So we have heart rate issues, blood pressure issues, breathing issues, diabetes, so our blood, blood sugar isn't stable. You start to see this big overlap between the symptoms of developmental trauma and what happens to us when we're living in uh, stress physiology 24 hours a day. It's mm -hmm. really kind of the same description. It's just in the ACE study, you see what happens if you're living like that for years and years and years, the body starts to break down. You know, when you talk about that freeze response, you're reminding me of, of uh, something that happened to me some, some years back uh, when one of my, uh, my, I have adult twins now, I've got four children and two of whom are uh, boy twins, except they're now men twins. <laughs> Isn't that funny how that happens? <laughs> yeah, uh, we, we refer to them as the babies for a long time. <laughs> Yeah, where are the babies? Who's, oh, who's yeah. looking after the babies? Yeah. <laughs> and it took us a long time to break that out. I bet. <laughs> yeah. Somewhere in our brains, there's still the baby, <laughs> yes. probably for my wife and yeah. me. Uh, and, and, you know, being twins, there's something wonderful that, ha that can happen around that, the intense connection that exists between twins. And there's this one incident where... Uh, uh, I remember I was in the upstairs hallway, and uh, one of my little twins, I don't know how old he would have been, but it would have been, you know, maybe two or three, and he was running towards me, and I don't remember why I said this, but I gave him a very forceful no, and he froze and fell over backward. <laughs> yeah. He just fell on the floor backward as yeah. if I had shot him. And I felt so guilty, but he, he had only received love and support and encouragement, I guess, from me up to that point, so that it was so shocking to yeah. be confronted by this other side of his father. You know, he got the father principle full force. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, yeah. Uh, so since I've stepped out of the uh, out a little bit here, let's take a moment here to give a little love to the sponsor of today's episode. I I let you know ahead of time that uh, there is a sponsor, and it's and they're Hello Fresh, America's most popular meal kit. Kathy, do you have any experience with meal kits, or I, have you ever considered joining such a service? I absolutely have, because I know people who use them, and I've been so curious about it, because it's always seemed like such a fabulous idea to me. I really like that idea of having everything available, because I know we all get into that little shorthand thing where we start doing the same thing every day because we can't figure yeah. out anything else, and it's right. always seemed to me someone else gets to be creative and then I get it made easy for me. So I have that curiosity about it. Yeah. Well, let me tell you a bit about them because uh, HelloFresh is a meal kit delivery service and they do the shopping and the planning and they deliver you uh, step-by-step -step recipes on a laminated card and they're pre-measured ingredients. So you can just kind of cook, eat and enjoy. And uh, so I had the opportunity to, to work with it. One of the things I really appreciate is that each box is made up of fresh and responsibly obtained ingredients, which is important to me. It's like, where is this stuff coming from? Is somebody being exploited? What's going on? But these are carefully selected farms and high rated trusted sources. So in fact, I just had the opportunity to test out three meals from HomeFresh. And they arrived on my doorstep in a box that had uh, 
frozen blocks, you know, to keep them to keep them mm -hmm. cold. And uh, and and the box had all the ingredients I would need, along with these simple and step by step instructions, and uh, one for each meal. There were like three bags, <laughs> three bags full, and three. Uh, chilled blocks, or I guess they've been frozen blocks of meat, for one for each meal. And so all the, it, the other thing that I really appreciate is that all the packaging materials were recyclable, which to me is a huge plus. Now, lucky guy that I am, my wife typically cooks our meals, and she was all too happy to have me go it alone. I said, hey, here's something <laughs> we could do together. <laughs> No, I think they want you to, <laughs> to do it by yourself. So oh, that's I, fabulous. I have to confess, I was a little apprehensive, despite the fact that, you know, I'm not totally helpless. I can, I can boil an egg. I can make scrambled eggs. I can put chops or steaks under a broiler. I can even bake a potato. Uh, <laughs> but still, you know, this was a different kind of venture. <sighs> Fortunately, all the ingredients come pre-measured and handy. Uh, labeled meal kits and little packages you, know, you could tear open this or that that you need for the recipe. So maybe you're wondering what my three meals were because I as was, you, actually. Yeah, because, <laughs> because as you mentioned, we, we can get in a, in a rut and the things I mentioned that I know how to cook are not particularly fancy. Well, my three meals were, they have rather grand names, chicken, sausage, or zoto. Korean Bibimbap, <laughs> and what? And then the one I made last night, Fun Day Fajita Bar. So um, it turns out my wife was especially liked the Korean bim bam bop, or bibim bop. <laughs> I'm not sure, <laughs> but it was fun. Now for myself, to be honest, I found there was a bit of a learning curve as I went along. And I got better at uh, preparing these meals because I learned some little lessons along the way. For example, I discovered that I should handle all the, the room temperature ingredients, the veggies and so on, wash them and di chop and dice them and all before firing up the stove. You know, unless there was some, unless the oven needed to be preheated or, or the pan needed to be preheated uh, because, you know, sometimes I could get, it's better to have all that stuff ready to go. That's right. that way. <laughs> yeah. Now, I, I would expect something like this to be expensive, but it turns out you can get this delicious feeling, filling, filling meals delivered right to your door every week for less than $10 per serving and, uh, and with free shipping. So, Kathy, of the features I've mentioned, which would be the most compelling for you? Well, the things that I've always been interested in is, first of all, what you just said, is that it's always seemed to me that in, in a way, someone's doing the shopping for you, they can do that at bulk. So sometimes you end up being able to prepare something that is more affordable than if you went and bought it yourself. Yeah, and the thing that I'm really curious about is exactly also what you said, is that it's going to stretch you a little bit to try new things. Yeah. So you know, really for me, the only way I'm going to do that is go to a restaurant. And then of course the costs are going to be much more expensive than if it were happening at home. And that's sometimes right. that's just kind of feels like more of a hassle than fun. So to yeah. have creative recipes that come into your house that are going to have a learning curve sometimes because you're trying something new and different. Mm -hmm. I've, that's part of the, the appeal for me as what I've heard from other people is what they enjoy so much is they end up making things they would never think to make for themselves. Yeah. Fresh right. ingredients, as you said, with wonderful ingredients that they're happy to use, but in new and different ways so that you really feel like you get this nice creative thing that comes right into your household and supports you in good food. Yeah, and to tie it into our previous discussion, it, it, uh, it builds the brain. It helps build <laughs> connection right? yeah, all that all that needing to learn the new temperature and whatever is going yeah. to expand your brain too <laughs> yeah so, so you're talking about the cost savings and and uh, here's what their offer is that for a total of 60 dollars off that's only 20 dollars off your first three boxes uh you're to visit hellofresh.com forward slash shrink six zero 
those are the numbers six zero and of course that references my web <laughs> my web id uh, shrink wrap radio so uh, uh, so you know you or anybody listening can go to hellofresh.com forward slash shrink six zero and uh, and so you use that as a promo code and it's like receiving six meals free or up to 50% off three boxes. So uh, just head on over to HelloFresh. Okay. So let's get back to your book. Okay. Uh, and uh, I was going to ask you all about the ACES study. <laughs> but <I think laughs> Little did I realize that uh, you were taking us through that already. So tell us more about what they found in relation to children well, and then maybe in, later in relation to adults. The ACE study actually is a study for adults. So we have to extrapolate some of the information. Um, and there are other researchers like Bruce Perry who have looked at what's happening to children. So I would say the difference would be you might see some of the same symptoms, but in more acute forms. And we're also going to see uh, an expression more of behavioral issues in children because they essentially they haven't had time to develop the physical health issues that the ACE study tells us about. That's but they will if we don't treat their early trauma. That's what we'll see as they grow to adulthood. So you'll yeah. see these more acute expressions in children of behavioral issues. And that's a piece of the Porges uh, research that he did actually is that children who are able to regulate their physiology better as they progress in their maturation process tend to exhibit fewer behavior issues. And for children who are not able to regulate their physiology at these young ages, then we are more inclined to see that develop into behavior issues as they get into mm -hmm. school age, for example, where they're away from the family and you start to see the behavior issues manifesting. So you can see some health issues with children, but you're more likely to see it in things like anxiety and um, acting out towards kids in school, violence towards other kids, aggression, that sort of thing. In adults, then unfortunately, it's kind of like a mushroom cloud where it keeps growing. So you start to see the physical issues, they've had time to develop. So by the time someone's in their 30s and 40s, you're seeing health issues. Um, that usually we affiliate with people who are older. In returning um, combat vets, one of the things, I don't know if they have a new name for it, but one of the things that they were seeing is what they were temporarily naming early aging syndrome, which mm. is they were seeing in young people in their 20s and 30s, diseases that we affiliate with the elderly. So they were, it was like it was fast forwarding the aging process when they wow. had that really bad combination of early trauma and then later shock trauma, because you don't have the resilience in place to deal with the later shock trauma. So you see a, a greater impact from that. So you'll see those physical issues that go, um, that manifest from the ACE that I talked about before. All of the social ills that we would see with addiction, um, and then all of that big category of behavioral psychological disorders that we now start to see are actually affiliated with early trauma. Yeah, I've not heard the term shock trauma before, but that's really an important distinction, I think. You know. That is, yeah. And, and that's just the terminology. It's getting a little cloudy now because we're seeing that um, there isn't as much a distinction as we thought. So shock trauma is considered to be a single event or a series of events that you could identify. And they um, have this same kind of effect of inducing the stress physiology, traumatic stress physiology, but they're considered to be short term. The trouble is if you have shock trauma for a child, it ends up having the same impact as anything else we would put in the category of developmental trauma. So if you have a car accident, if you have surgeries, if you have some of the things that we think of as shock trauma, single events, but they occur at a young age, they can end up being developmental trauma. And then what I just said before, where you have developmental trauma already on board, that person has typically less resilience to deal with the later shock trauma. So that later incident or series of incidents has a different impact on them. So this separation and delineation between developmental trauma and shock trauma 
I think is getting changed as we understand that they don't really function as completely separate and discrete types of trauma. They influence each other um, very, very strongly depending on when they occur and what happened in our childhood before we're exposed to later shock trauma events. Uh huh. Yeah, that's reminding me of uh, it was either Freud or I think one of the early psych psychoanalysts that used the metaphor of an army that uh, is marching forward. And let's say they they get into a battle and some of the troops are killed, so the rest of them continue to march forward. They have another uh, encounter with with resistance again some of them perish and so as the army keeps moving forward it's getting weaker and weaker right. and and you know and eventually may meet a shock if you will that it can't handle that's and, right. and, and loses so that's always that somehow that metaphor uh, stuck in my mind of uh, the impact of the cumulative impact i guess as we move through our lives of the different assaults uh, yeah, that, uh, and that we... that's also what the ACE study showed us is the, they call them ACEs. So when you're taking the questionnaire, then you count up, you get one point. This is a kind of a weird way to do it, but mm -hmm. every ACE that you've experienced counts as a point. And then there's these thresholds. Once you get up above four adverse childhood experiences, you start to see some changes in the statistics. And mm -hmm. by the time you get up to seven or eight of them, you have very different, um, exactly as you said, there's a kind of attrition that happens in terms of our capacities and our resilience. So by the time you're in the seven or eight adverse childhood experiences, which are these different categories, you have multiple exposures to different categories, then you're starting to really see the higher percentages of people who will manifest the uh, symptoms affiliated with that trauma. So you go from maybe 10 or 20% of people who've had these exposures to 70 or 80% because there's exactly, as you said, there's just so many insults that have accumulated over the course of the life. And you also have to consider what was happening that created those exposures. What was happening in the environment? So you have the person who is chronically exposed to violence in the neighborhood chronically exposed to not enough food and not an inadequate medical care, chronically exposed to disrupted families, someone in the family is incarcerated, another person in the family is drug addicted. So the environment now has very little in it that's going to support development of resilience. So if we step back and look at why these factors are happening to the person, not just the answer the question, but consider the bigger picture, what's happening in the family and in the social, in the community as a whole. On the other side of it, you're not seeing the factors that build resilience. So mm -hmm. you have an absence of resilience and you have an increase in insult in, in these exposures. And that starts to be quite a devastating recipe. Yeah, yeah, really. You know, we're used to t talking or thinking about uh, a spectrum in relation to autism, but in your book, you write about trauma spectrum disorders. Uh, tell us about that spectrum, if you will. It's basically the same idea, is that you can have people who have been exposed to a more modest, if you want to use that word, um, level of trauma, and they may have symptoms, but the symptoms won't be as severe and they'll be more the person will be more able to work around them. Um, they'll come up when the person's under duress or they arise in certain contexts, but they're not particularly driving the person's life and behavior and development of self. And then you move down the spectrum and you've had more severe exposure. You've had less resilience for whatever reason, genetic or environmental lack of development. And then you've had more exposures to adverse childhood experiences or more exposures to shock trauma. And that changes then that mix so that you're starting to see a spectrum that has moved further along in, on the graph, so to speak. And yeah. then you can start to see in terms of the newer thinking of untreated developmental trauma, then you start to see personality disorders, what are often termed as personality disorders. Um, and you have a more serious mix. And, and it's very rare in my uh, 
practice. I'm not a psychotherapist. I'm a body oriented practitioner. My area of specialty is working with people who have physical symptoms that have arisen from their trauma, both shock trauma and developmental trauma. So they're exhibiting the somatic symptoms. And what I can say from my own practice and my client population, many of them would be high on the ACE score. So they would be people that would be at six, seven, eight or above on their exposure to adverse childhood experience study. They tend to be a little bit older. So they're a young client for me would be in their 40s. Mm. So they've had enough time to manifest the physical symptoms. Yeah. And really what you see in that trauma spectrum, so to speak, is by the time you get into what's often referred to as complex trauma, they're exhibiting psychological and personality symptoms and physical symptoms. So they have this mix and then you get this really awful recipe where they have further exposure to hospitalizations, um, to psychiatric interventions. They've been hospitalized for psychiatric reasons. And now you have this further exposure to potentially traumatizing events that are happening for them when their life feels like it spins out of control. And their health is such that they're essentially, with some of my clients, they're essentially disabled by their health issues. They can't work. Um, their, their health and psychological issues are so severe, they are disconnected in their community. They aren't able to sustain friendships. Um, their own anxiety is so severe, sometimes they have trouble getting out of the house to even get treatment. So then we're talking about being pretty far down the spectrum. So to Yeah, they're going to be considered chronic. Right? That's right. And, and, and a lot severe. of people don't want to have to deal with that. That's it, right. It, they have the... Uh, the expectation, rightly or wrongly, that uh, they're not going to be able to make much of a difference, which makes me wonder, uh, you describe yourself as a somatic worker. What does that come down to? Are you using touch as part of your treatment or just how do you work with, with these people? For me, because I have a, a kind of an advocacy for the use of touch in different contexts, including in psychotherapy. And that's because so much of what we're talking about with developmental trauma occurs in the preverbal stages. Mm -hmm. It happens when our physical interactions with our environment and our caregiver are really the primary way that we're recognizing safety or lack of safety. And so some of the um, conversations, so to speak, need to happen at that deep somatic level that are not about language. So I am a touch-oriented practitioner. I could do other techniques. I've been trained in other methods like somatic experiencing that has a, a somatic focus where you're tracking sensations and tracking body response. And there's many wonderful practices that work in that way. But my area of skillfulness is using touch and using touch with a population of people where it's sometimes complicated to use touch because they've been hurt by touch. They've been physically abused or they've had painful medical procedures and medical interventions. So touch can be problematic for them. And I have enough experience in education to be able to navigate the rocky shores with somebody when touch has not always been a positive thing for them. So for me, I'm really committed to that, to the use of touch for both repairing someone's experience of touch, but also for having these kind of somatic conversations that are difficult to have verbally. Yeah, so there are, uh, as you've pointed out, there's so many different pathways into uh, becoming damaged in the ways that we've been talking about. So I imagine that, that similarly, you would not treat everyone the same way or right. treat, treat them all in, with the same source of, of touch. But uh, let us be a fly on the wall and maybe you could give us some examples of how you would use touch with, you know, maybe thinking about some past cases. Well, um, and I'll just differentiate the way that I'm going to do it would be different than many of the people who study with me and with Steve Terrell, who is the co-author in the book, because many of the people who study with us are psychotherapists. And one okay. of the other areas of expertise that I developed as a teacher kind of accidentally is introducing psychotherapists to the use of touch. Because I was on the faculty for years of a somatic psychology program in Australia. 
Um, and my job was to teach our budding psychotherapists how to incorporate touch into their psychotherapy practices. So each of us has to incorporate touch in the way that's appropriate within our licensure and our scope of practice. Okay. So the way I can use it might be different than the way a psychotherapist would use it. But How so? I would, pardon me? How so? What's helping? Well, understand. because as a body worker, I'm allowed to kind of cross that line to also be fixing, doing repair work, so to speak. So if I have a client who comes to me and they've had a car accident, and they've been physically injured in the accident and they have a traumatic stress response affiliated with it, I can work with both of those things at the same time. It's part of my job to help them recover from their physical injury as well as help them recover from the traumatic stress that happened with it in the sense of getting their physiology regulated. Whereas a psychotherapist isn't really allowed to work with the physical injury part, but it's certainly appropriate for them to work with the traumatic stress piece and maybe there are life impacts that are happening as a result of that accident, their, their relationship, their marriage, or their relationship with their children has been disrupted because maybe they're now in chronic pain and they can't be in the family in the way they have been before. That becomes the job of the psychotherapist to work with those elements that are related to the accident that wouldn't be part of my job. So it's you really- seem, You seem so knowledgeable about psychotherapy that it makes me wonder if you haven't somewhere along the line been tempted to um, to add that training to your quiver. Well, I have to say I've been tempted, but then I also, like I said, I have this commitment to, in a way, serving an underserved population. Yeah. And the the population of people that are manifesting physical symptoms of trauma don't get really great care in the way that we've divided up our care delivery system. Because we've broken the, the delivery up into physical and psychological, and then we have all these rules about how each of those types of practices can happen, for the client that's got a mix of very severe physical symptoms affiliated with their traumatic stress, there's not many places for them to go to get really informed help. And that's my client population. And so I feel like I could detour over onto the psychological side and spend many years training and getting enough experience to feel good enough at it to be doing interventions, or I can keep training myself in the way I am now and keep serving this underserved population. So each time I've been tempted, I come back to saying, you know, these skills are much, very much needed out there in the trauma world, so to speak. And one of the ways that I can be helpful is as a teacher to teach psychotherapists, part of the reason I know so much about it is I've been teaching psychotherapists how to incorporate touch in their practices for 30 something years now. Yeah. So I, I'm kind of well versed in that interplay. Um, but then I feel like I can do a lot of good by helping people develop their skills to incorporate touch into the psychotherapy practice. Yeah, you're right that that um, psychotherapy licensure actually can kind of tie one's hands in some ways, because uh, you have to worry about, you know, am I going to get sued down the road, you know, if uh, yeah. some, this person might, uh, might want to sue me for one reason or another for something they've imagined. And it's so weird because actually um, the research that we have shows that psychotherapists that incorporate touch into their practice have lower rates of lawsuits. Mm, and wow, they, that's interesting. Because they feel cared for, probably. <laughs> well, one of the things that we know in that research is that clients of the psychotherapists who are using touch feel more understood, they, are, they feel more cared for, and they actually, interestingly, feel the interventions are more effective, even though the therapists don't feel like they're making different interventions than they are with other clients. So huh. there's something about touch that can potentiate huh. our positive experience if it's done well. And that's why I'm so committed yeah. to teaching about it, because yeah. it doesn't mean you take a massage class and now you know how to touch people in the context of psychotherapy. It's a different need, as we were talking about before, the need to do touch work in the repair context is very different than the need to do touch work in the psychotherapy context. It's a slightly different set of skills and takes less technical knowledge in a way on the psychotherapy side. You don't need to know all the anatomy, physiology, but you do need to know what the impact of your touch is likely to be 
and yeah. how to understand the person's response to touch and how to repair their past experiences of touch. And for me, going back to the question you asked before about being a fly on the wall, what would be happening? Yeah. A lot of what would be happening is really about developing better regulation in the physiology. Because in terms of developmental trauma, that's often what's fueling the symptoms, whether those are physical symptoms or otherwise. And so in, in the book, one of the ways that Steve Terrell and I talk about it is really the treatment plan you can see for developmental trauma is regulation, 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 and then do more regulation. Because it's that regulation of the foundational systems that was missing in developmental trauma. And so that's a lot of the emphasis of what we're doing in terms of repair. Yeah, we should mention that that your co-author and co-worker is in fact a, a therapist, right? That's right, that's right, yeah. And, so and we teach the got, class together for that um, reason, yeah. Yeah, are you covered by any kind of licensure? I'm not in the state of California because the, Cal the state doesn't have licensure. In, in, anywhere <laughs> in no, Australia? They have, well, anywhere? in in um, California, they have a strange thing where it's a city by city license. Oh my goodness. Certain states have licenses for the kind of work that I do, but it ver as it does for psychotherapists, the licensing varies state to state. And we have the same thing in terms of body work, any kind of touch work. Um, there is a certification process in California. I'm certified, but it's not considered to be a license. I so see. It's a little bit of an odd thing is a little bit of a yeah. leftover in California in terms of the tolerance that California has always had for non-traditional practices. They haven't been in a big hurry to license things. Um, yeah. In some states, the licensing is very clear and um, allows for these different types of practices in a little bit of a, a more supportive way for the practitioners, yeah. um, as you would have for psychotherapists. For those of us that do this kind of touch-oriented work, we have to kind of figure out a lot of this on our own in terms of scope of practice. And it's not defined for us very clearly. So we're left to our own devices, which is mm -hmm. another reason that I'm a strong um, proponent of people working in their scope of practice and defining that clearly so that they're working ethically, legally and ethically within their scope. And particularly in states like California where the licensing isn't clear, there's not a lot of support for practitioners to get clear in that way. Whereas a yeah. psychotherapist, their licensing boards give them that support. They tell, they tell you what you can and can't do. And your professional associations tell you what you can and can't do. And that's actually a little easier then. Yeah. yeah, I know some people get massage licensing to kind of cover the idea that they can touch people. Well, the yeah. idea that you can touch people as a psychotherapist is actually well established. Uh -huh. In the state of California, that's very, very well established. In many states, um, the use of touch in psychotherapy is not considered to be odd or um, all that unusual because there's a long history of it being incorporated into the psychotherapy practice. So the, the things that you want to know are the usual things is you need to be, I think, you need to be trained in it. That always helps to have yeah. some training that's specific to the work that you're doing. And one of the funny issues that happens in relation to touch and psychotherapy, again, the research shows us many, many psychotherapists are using touch in their practices, but they're not disclosing it to their fellow professionals. And I think that's such a bad idea because it has so much of this potential for reenactment. I'm doing this secret thing that I can't talk about with you. Huh. We have yeah. a special thing we do together, but we don't talk to anybody else about it. This is not a healthy way to incorporate touch into your practice. Yeah. So if you're going to incorporate it, then it needs to be like anything else that you're using. You take notes about it. You disclose to the client why you're using it. You should know why you're using it. Some psychotherapists that learn touch, when I do consultations with them, what I hear is they were using touch because they couldn't figure out what else to do. They kind of got befuddled about how to be helpful to the client. So they wanted to be helpful. So they thought a touch intervention would calm their client down. That's not a good reason to use it. You want to know why you're using it, what, how it's going to be helpful to the client. You should be able to articulate that to the client. And certainly if you're working with people with trauma, you need consent. So for me, they know when they come to me, they're coming to a touch-oriented practitioner, but we're still having conversations about touch 
and yeah. I'm still asking permission. I'm still checking with them to see if it's okay. And do we need to do something different? And I'm supporting them and saying no, because sometimes the best thing somebody can do in relationship to touch is to find a boundary and be able to say no to it. Maybe mm -hmm. for the first time in their lives, if they've been abused or had necessary medical procedures that they really didn't want, but they were helpful to them, but it still felt like a boundary breach to them. For them to say, no, I don't actually want you to touch me is a huge step towards repair in their trauma. Yeah. So for me, the ability to create that boundary is potentially the most significant thing that might happen in relation to touch. Yeah. So then I think we need to be well informed as practitioners. If we're going to work with a trauma population, whether we're physical care providers or whether we're psychotherapists, we need to be aware of the what has contributed to their trauma and what can be helpful to it and touch is one of the things that could be helpful but it has to be done in the right way so for me i'm i'm an advocate of it but it has to be done in a healthy and informed way yeah yeah i recently interviewed somebody from and i've forgotten the exact name of the association but it's something like the international uh, somatic uh, uh, somatic therapy association or that's the gist of it. That's not mm -hmm. the exact name. And so are, are you aware of that organization? Is that part yeah. of it? No. Yeah. And um, one of the odd things that we have in North America is this kind of strict separation between these professions. And in some places in Europe, for example, you don't see that same separation. So I've spoken to physicians who were trained as a part of their medical training to do breath work for example. Yeah. And there's, there's many psychotherapists that incorporate touch into their practices in different countries overseas. And we sort of think of it as being odd, but it's a normal thing there. So they don't have that same strange relationship to touch that we've developed. So some of these international somatic associations have a more robust kind of training in terms of supporting um, psychotherapists or any kind of therapist to do this combination of trauma work and physical work, either somatic orientation or touch work. They support each other in that way. Mm -hmm. You can have a somatic orientation without using touch. And you can, you know, certainly if you're using touch, typically you have a very strong somatic perspective in your work. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm uh, impressed by uh, the professionalism uh, that that you bring into your work just you know just talking about it that really comes through and thank you uh, yeah it's and something I, that's very very important to me because i feel like um our our cultural relationship with touch right now has gotten kind of odd where we've pathologized touch and i've been a very strong advocate for many many years of the way that touch can be beneficial but I also feel like we have to show up as professionals if we're going to be advocating for something that's considered a little bit odd. <laughs> you know, that's just yeah. fair enough. You know, I feel like I need to be able to explain in a way that makes sense to other professionals why using touch might be helpful or using even this somatic approach might be helpful. In this case, we're talking about trauma. There's a lot of different ways it could be helpful. But certainly in trauma, it has so much potential in developmental trauma because as i said the wounding occurred in many cases where we didn't have language and it's the language of touch that's going to help us move towards healing so i feel like just like we are expected to be professionals when we're using verbal language to move towards healing we need to be professional in how we're using the tool of touch as well and how we're articulating it to our clients and also to our fellow professionals so that they can understand why they might be supportive of this in our work with the clients that we might share. Well, I'm totally on board with, with what you're saying. And uh, I think you're an excellent representative for that point of view. Thank and you. So, um, maybe this is a good place for us to wrap things up unless okay. you've got Anything no. else you want to say? I, no, I think, <laughs> I think that's plenty. <laughs> okay, yeah, well, I think you really got your point across. So, Kathy Kane, I really want to thank you for being my guest today on Shrink Wrap Radio. It's been my pleasure. Thank you.